For Creamer Media's Policy, I'm Sash Nimadli. Award-winning journalist Jonathan Anser unpacks his latest book, 50 Fibs That Made South Africa. 50 Fibs That Made South Africa is an interesting concept for a book. Can you talk us through the inspiration to seek out and debunk some of the lies that we've grown up believing or seen play out in the news and in politics? So I think what happened was I got a call from the publisher, Jeremy Borain. He's from Jonathan Ball. And he said to me, he's got an interesting idea for a book. And so he wanted to meet with me and we met for coffee. And he said to me, book about the lies that we've been told, the lies that have shaped South Africa. And I thought this was really a great concept. Um, I love the idea. I love, I love history. I love grappling with the ideas of history. And so I thought, yeah, let, let me go ahead and, and start researching. And I started picking out some lies and I started panicking when I, when I did that because I thought, you know, telling a book about lies has to be so absolutely true. And I thought, well, I'm not actually a historian and how am I going to find the truth? And then about after a month when I was battling, I got an email from Jeremy to say, we've been discussing it and we think uh, we've got a nice title for the book. And he <laughs> sent me a, a mock-up of the, of the the front cover and the mock-up said, bullshit. And I think that actually focused me because it meant that I could tackle these lies as a journalist, looking at possibly some of the lies that I've been told, some of the lies that I've believed, and um, looking at debunking them. And I think that gave me the impetus to carry on. Now, you come out strong in the first chapter where you reveal that the results from South Africa's first democratic election was not exactly what it seemed. Can you briefly tell our viewers about the quiet controversy around the election results? Yeah, so that was the 1994 election. And I'd always kind of felt after that election that um, it was just too good to be true. Everybody, all the political parties got exactly what they wanted. And um, that was really one of the first lies, well, deceptions maybe, that I thought was worth looking into. I then made contact with Stephen Friedman, who's a political analyst. I'd, I'd read a paper that he had, had written arguing the same point, saying that actually the 1994 elections weren't absolutely accurate. Everybody got exactly what they wanted. The ANC got a landslide majority, but not quite the two thirds that they needed to change the constitution. The IFP, who had been sort of battling um, and was determined not to get into the election, joined the, the process at the very last minute. And then they got uh, in, enough votes to secure a KZN and for the leader, Patulesi, to be included in the cabinet. And the National Party also saved face. They won the Western Cape and um, their leader, F.W. de Klerk, became a, a, one of the deputy presidents. So it just felt too good to be true. And speaking to Stephen Friedman, I think it was too good to be true. So our democracy started on, we don't quite call it a lie, but he, he says it was maybe a fictionalized truth that uh, in the end, it was a negotiated settlement. You also write in your book that no matter what leaders in the country say, violence against women is not a top priority for them. Why do you say that? Yeah, there are some lighthearted chapters and then there are some chapters that I wrote and made me angry. And I think that chapter made me angry because I, I feel that our political leaders paid lip service to violence against women. It feels like it's, it's used as a political opportunity. And instead of actually doing something about it, they keep on just telling us that they're going to do something about it. So the take home message that I felt is stop telling us what you're going to do and just start showing us what you've done. And looking at some of the most horrific examples of violence against women, it's clear that it isn't a priority. And to those who say Nelson Mandela sold out the nation, and despite arguments about the property clause in the new constitution after apartheid, you counter that he didn't betray the dreams of young black South Africans, but rather that corruption did. Can you just expand on that? Yeah, so I kind of <laughs> uh, have a couple of chapters on, on Nelson Mandela in the book, um, looking at you know whether he was a terrorist, that, that lie with the National Party told, looking at whether he was a saint, and looking at whether he sold out 
the country as a lot of uh, younger people. And it was something that we saw quite strongly in the fees must fall protests. It was quite a strong sentiment. And I think the answer is really to look at, at this leader from the human perspective. I don't believe he sold out the country. I think he actually made huge sacrifices, remarkable sacrifices. And I think he was a remarkable human being. And I, I do think he was betrayed by the corruption. I, I think he had set the course, South Africa's course. And um, if it wasn't derailed by the looting and the corruption, I think people wouldn't sort of have the sentiment that he betrayed. And I can understand it because when you see the, the anger among young people, you can really understand the sentiment that they have, the bitterness and the anger, where their parents felt that this was going to be an opportunity for them to climb out of poverty, and that hasn't happened. But I, I don't think uh, Mandela is the, the reason for that. Now, your book also gives a succinct argument for those who say that life was better under apartheid. Can you briefly give us an overview? Yeah, I, it, it also was one of the first lies that I, I wanted to tackle because it's a common refrain, life was better under apartheid. And I think it chooses to or pretends to ignore the reality of what apartheid was. Apartheid was this dreadful, dreadful crime against humanity. And to try and compare a democracy to a crime against humanity is just not on. I mean, there's a lot wrong with our democracy. There's a lot wrong with where we are. There is corruption. There is looting. There is load shedding. There is high levels of crime. You know, our democracy has been battered and bruised. But to compare it to apartheid just doesn't make sense to me. So you, you can criticize this democracy. And in a democracy, you can criticize that democracy. But to compare it to a crime against humanity, I, I think is a lie. And I think it fuels or it feeds into other sentiments. And then just going a bit back into the past, your book also covers the lie that colonialism brought civilization to Africa. Yeah, so this really was the first lie we were told, which was that when uh, the colonialists arrived, they arrived into this empty land, the empty land myth. And I think, again, it also underpinned apartheid ideology, because what it really said was, well, you know, we were here, and there was nobody here, so we entitled and justified to all the riches of this country. And I think that was a very convenient myth that the National Party was very happy to to perpetuate. Um, and of course, it, it fit right into all these other myths of apartheid, justifying an ideology. And uh, so it's, it's almost the, the original sin, South Africa's original sin. Now, as you've said, your book covers a range of lies that were taught and told. And these range from colonialism to apartheid to lies in sports and politics. Were there any lies or myths that you debunked that shocked you the most? Okay, it didn't shock me in the sense that that, that I believed it to be true, and then I, I I found out that it wasn't. I always knew it wasn't true, but when the pastor resurrected this poor Elliot, which is one of the lies that I told, the resurrection lie, I think it shocked me how many people believed it, how many people kind of seemed to believe all these miracles that, that these prophets conjure up taking selfies with God, um, going off to heaven and uh, uh, having phone calls with God and um, resurrecting the dead and uh, curing all sorts of ailments. I think that really surprised me, not <laughs> to, to debunk their lies, but how many people actually seem to believe it. And lastly, in a world filled with lies and liars, which you point out towards the end of the book, what should be the biggest takeaway if we are to make sense of our history? Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is to see who's telling that history and to try and look at the sources. And that was something that I, I looked at with Sharka, looking at, at what I had been told at, at primary school about Sharka, and then going to speak to somebody who had made it his life's mission to study Sharka and, and seeing what I had been told, which kind of had all been a pack of lies, and then looking at it from a, the perspective of somebody who's really done done the research and tells us that most of what we've learned uh, about him was all made up. 
and looking at why it was made up and looking at who had interest in making it up. So I think that was my take home message is, is to kind of look at who is telling you this truth and is it the truth? That was journalist Jonathan Anser unpacking his latest book, 50 Fibs That Made South Africa.